Hello to you. Welcome to the first chapter of the CCMP Enterprise Advanced Routing course. The presentations in this course have been broken up into four parts to make it a little bit easier to digest. <coughs> so within part one, we'll be looking at IPv4 addressing and DHCP server. Now, all of this content should be revision. Okay, we've gone through the CCNA course, all of this has been covered within that. So it's just a good refresher. So to start off with, we'll go through why do we use IPv4? It provides a unique address within the network. We need that so that the packets are received by the intended recipients. It's imperative that you have a good understanding of addressing, how to check, make sure your devices are within the correct network. So to do this, we'll go through the division of what makes up an IP address and look at examples of how decisions are made based on the network ID within an IP address. Now, in section four, we'll go through troubleshooting tickets that relate to IPv4 addressing. But hopefully by now, you've got a reasonable understanding of troubleshooting techniques. So as a reminder, there's two parts to a network address, and that's the address of the network and the host portion. So the network portion can be referred to as the network or subnet portion. Now, why the difference is because the original parent network back in the day when we had class four addressing was known as the network address. You then subnetted that parent into smaller parts to create child or subnets. And that was defined because whenever you look at a routing table, the parent network would always be separated out. And then the known subnets or children would be listed below it. So that, that's where the, I believe the difference comes from. Now, in this scenario, we're going to look at why or how PC1 can directly communicate to PC2 based on this topology down in the bottom right. So if we look at the addressing and the subnet mask of PC1, we have it laid out in binary here. Now with addressing, you always revert it back to its true form of binary to be able to work that address space correctly. So when we configure a device, we give it an IP address, subnet mask, and if it's an end device such as PC1, we also give it a default gateway. So the purpose of the subnet mask is to tell the devices which portion of the address is which. So within the subnet mask, 
the ones which are consecutive from the left hand side represent the network address space. The zeros in the subnet mask represent the host portion. So if we look here, we have all the consecutive ones, which if you convert them back to dotted decimal notation, you will get this 255, 255, 255, 192. Now, at this stage, if you need to do a refresher on binary addressing, I suggest we uh, pause this video and go back and do a, a look within the CCNA course and have a look. So, when we look at separating the network address from the host address when there's ones the original value just falls through so we end up with 10 1 1 and 0 why is it 0 because the host portion is arrays so it becomes zeros So when we combine, or compare is probably a better word, the PC1 subnet ID with that of PC2, we'll see that the bits are exactly the same for the network portion of the address. This is how PC1 can conclude it's on the same network as PC2 and can communicate directly. There's no need to go up to the router because they are on the same network. Now, if we wanted to talk to the web server, and let's jump back to the diagram here, the web page or web server is on the other side of the router at 192.0.2.1 so in this example we'll be looking at a network that requires it to go via the default gateway so again we do the anding function and get PC1's network address and we compare that address with that of the web server and straight away we can see that the very first bit is different we don't need to check any further because we know it's a different network so therefore PC1 needs to resolve its addressing to the default gateway this allows it to send the information out to the outside world. So PC1 now knows 192.0.2.1 is not part of its network. So it needs to go up to the default gateway to be forwarded to its destination. Lots of words around that. Now, how do we know how to do this? Remember that we're looking at the subnet mask and the subnet mask can be any range of addresses that are defined now if we look at the very last position of 
the ones in the submap mask. It'll tell you the values that the network or subnetworks jump up in. So again, looking at the topology, we have 192 as the so we look at the last binary one, it's 64. So it's the first two bits, 128 and 64. So the network jumps up in increments of 64. So if we look at these two addresses, you can quickly tell that 20 is within the first 64 and 74 is in the second group of 64. So straight away, just looking at the IP addresses and the subnet mask information there, you should be able to tell that these two belong to different networks. And as such, will not be able to communicate directly to each other. And as they are on the shared network space, this is going to be a problem. So, if you're not using static IP addressing, which we should only use for fixed services, such as servers, printers, things that need to be at a fixed location in the addressing, all our other host machines should be automatically assigned. So to do this, we use DHCP. Now we'll look at the IPv4 version of this first before going any further. So let's just go through the DORA process. So this is discover, offer, request, acknowledgement. So the client, when it boots up, it sends out a DHCP discover message and all the local DHCP servers will respond with an offer. The client will then select which one it wishes to make a request of. In other words, it's requesting to use the parameters within a particular offer. And then the server acknowledges whether that IP address is still available for use by that client. Now, it's fairly simple and straightforward. Generally speaking, the first offer the client receives will be the one it requests. So, what's the message? Well, the message is broadcast out so the IP address will be all 255s and the MAC address will be all Fs so it's broadcast at layer 2 and layer 3 now the source IP address cannot be filled out so it's all zeros because it's requesting that information. But the source MAC address will be that of the MAC address of the device sending the discovery message. Because that's the only address the device knows it has at this point. When the server receives that offer message, it responds, sorry, when it receives the discovery message, it will respond with the offer. Now this offer will be 
of an IP address, subnet mask and default gateway at a minimum. Okay, this IP address is not leased to any other devices at this stage. This is sent back to the client. And now the client, if it wishes to use or lease that address, will send back a request and that request will identify which offer it wants to take up. The server will respond with an acknowledgement indicating that that IP address has now been leased to the client and any further options that are configured from that server will be included with that lease. Now, in the case that the DHCP server is not on the same local network, we can set the router to forward these messages. Now remember, your discover message is a broadcast. So the default action of a router is to deny forwarding to any broadcast message. So it will convert the broadcast to a specific unicast message and send it directly to a registered server. Now, how do we register this server to the device? We do this with the command IP helper. Now, the full command is IP helper hyphen address and then the IP address of the server. Now in the example here, we have a client that resides on the 172.16.1.0 slash 24 network and the server resides on the 10.1.1 network. So within our inbound interface, okay, our default gateway from the client perspective, we need to configure the IP helper address on the inbound interface. So as the discovery message arrives on the router, it knows to forward it to this address Now, within that simple command, we forward or relay more than just DHCP. It also forwards TFTP, DNS, Internet Time Service, NetBIOS information, BootP, and TACAX. So it will forward multiple services to that specific device. So there are more than the basic messages. So discover goes out using port 67 the offer is port 68. The request, then the one we don't talk about, the decline. So this is the message saying that it's declining the use of the proposed lease. Okay, so if you've got more than one DHCP server in effect, it'll decline the one it's not going to use. The server acknowledgement. The other one that we don't see in the examples is the app opposite 
the negative. So this is when the server declines the request from the client. In other words, it sent that offer out to multiple devices and it's leased it out to another client. So therefore, it has to decline the lease. Then you have DHCP release. This releases the lease back into the pool of addresses on the server. So it can be used again. And then inform, which gives us information of the IP configuration. So how do we configure this on a router? On the interface that we wish to receive a dynamic IP address. So if we're looking at our ISP, ISPs normally send IP addressing via DHCP to the networks. So to tell that interface that it is to receive its IP addressing via DHCP server, we go to that interface and we type in IP address DHCP. So now this interface knows its IP addressing is going to be assigned via DHCP server and it initiates the client behavior. So we'll send out a discovery message. Now to configure that the router as the DHCP server, we do this in global configuration. First, we exclude any of the static IP addresses that we've used within our addressing range for printers, gateways, that sort of thing. We can have more than one excluded address command. Okay, so if they're not sequential, we can have more than one excluded address command to exclude all the addresses that we need to exclude. IP DHCP pool, pool name, then the network address and subnet mask, default router, this is our default gateway address. If we know the DNS server address and the NetBIOS server address. So if you notice over on the left hand side, we go into DHCP configuration submodes. So we leave global configuration and move it into DHCP configuration mode. You can have more than one pool configured on the router. So if you are serving multiple local area networks from the one router, you can have each pool of addressing configured and based on which interface the discover message comes in on, the device knows which pool of addresses to assign Now, possible reasons why DHCP may fail. If you do not have the IP helper address configured, the router will not forward broadcasts. 
the pool of addresses is exhausted, so it's got no more addresses to give out. If you've made a typo in the configuration of the DHCP server, if you've got a duplicate address, such as a static address and a dynamic address overlapping, Redundant services not communicating. So in other words, we've got a service that is similar to DHCP, such as BP or something else, that is blocking each other. If you've made a change to your DHCP pool after leases have been given out, the server cannot push or pull information. Okay, so the client needs to be the one that releases its lease and requests the new information. So you've got to reset all your clients before they can pull the current correct information from the DHCP server. You have to configure the interface so that it knows it's a member of the pool. So for an example, if it's a multi-layer switch acting as the DHCP server, it needs to have a corresponding SVI that belongs to that DHCP pool so that it knows to activate the pool or going back up to our top one if the request is coming in it also needs to know potentially where the server is if it's not actually on the multi-layer switch so it needs to know that IP helper address. So there's a few little issues there. So how can I look at what's going on? Well, one of the commands you can use is show IP DHCP conflict. Now this is within privilege mode. And I'll tell you if it's registered any conflicts within the IP addressing range and how that was discovered. So here we can see that 172.16.1.3 has a duplication and it was discovered via ping date and time. Now after resolving the problem with the duplicate address <coughs> we can clear the conflicts so clear IP DHCP conflict asterisk the asterisk is a wildcard so that will clear all of the conflict listing to find out which Leases have been given out. We can use show IP DHCP binding. Again, from the privilege mode. And it will give us a list of all the IP addresses it's leased. The MAC address of the lease holder. And the lease expiry date and time and the type of assignment. So whether it was automatic, static. Now, debugging. De 
Bug commands are very powerful as they are live information. Whereas a show command is only a snapshot. It'll only tell you the information about what's occurring exactly at the time you press the enter on the show command. It will not update itself. Whereas a debug command will continually update as information changes that match the criteria of the debug command. So it's quite powerful. But it consumes resources on the device, so ensure that you always turn them off after you're finished with them. So in this case, we want to look at what's going on with our DHCP server. So debug IP DHCP server events. So each time the server sends or receives a message, you'll get an update occur. Now the other option there is packet and this one will actually show you each message as it comes in. So each packet that arrives or is sent you will get messages coming up telling you what's going on. So here it's telling you that it's received a release message and then it list the criteria of the message. Here it's saying it's looking for a relay for the client. Here it's saying it's received a discovery request. And you can read the messages as each packet arrives. Now, how do you turn it off? Just as with every other command, you put the no in front of the command to turn it off. Or you can use the default turn everything off on the debug, which is undebug all. UN debug one word space A double L. So that says turn off all debugging on this device. Much easier to type when you're having lots and lots of information scrolling past the prompt. So it's one I recommend you get used to typing blind because you'll always have messages popping up at inconvenient times while you're typing. This brings us to the conclusion of part one. In part two, we'll be looking at IPv6 addressing and the DHCP for IPv6. Hope you find this information useful, and I'll see you in the next video.